On board the HMS Indomitable, three new recruits join the ranks. One of them, a foundling by the name of Billy Budd. Kind and handsome, he is at first hailed a jewel by the master at arms, John Claggett. Later, though, it's Claggett's feelings towards him which will alter Billy's course towards a devastating series of events. Based on the short novel by Herman Melville, Benjamin Britten's opera Billy Budd was first performed here at the Royal Opera House in December of 1951. 68 years later, and after nearly two decades off the stage, the Royal Opera are preparing to perform the incredible work again with a new production from, di from director Deborah Warner. My name is Chloe Miller-Smith, welcome. This evening we're going to be lifting the lid on the work. So, to begin, Let's hear some of Benjamin Britten's stunning writing with Captain Veer's prologue performed by Toby Spence with Susanna Stranders at the piano. also read books and studied and pondered and tried to fathom eternal, eternal Much good has been shown me and much evil and the good has never been perfect there is always some flaw in it some defect some imperfection in the divine image some fault in the angelic song some stammer in the divine speech so that the devil still has something to do with every human consignment to this planet of earth
has blessed me, who made me. In the summer of 1797, in the French wars, in the difficult and dangerous days after the mutiny at the north, in the days when I, Edward Fairfax Vere, commanded the indomitable. Huge thanks there to Toby and Susanna. We're going to hear a little bit more from them later. Now, to introduce us to Britain the Man and, of course, to his seafaring opera, please welcome Lucy Walker from the Britain Peers Foundation. Hello. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you so much for being with us. Not at all. This is a piece you know very well. I wondered if we could start um, by you giving us a little synopsis of the piece. Of course, yes. Um, we've just heard the first bit, that's the very first um, aria, which is Captain Veer, who captained the Indomitable, looking back at events that happened um, many years before. And then the whole opera then starts, as it were, in flashback from then, from then on. Um, and it, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's about Billy, a young sailor who was press-ganged uh, or um, coerced into becoming a member of this, this ship. Um, and he's hugely popular, he's lovely, he's sweet, he's keen as a bean, he's very um, handsome and becomes a real pet of the whole crew. But he gets the, um, catches the eye of John Claggett, who um, is disturbed by Billy's um, nature, by his beauty, by his goodness, and sings an aria called Beauty, Handsomeness, Goodness, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, what have you done to me? Um, and is disturbed by this on, on all sorts of levels, um, but it, it triggers something in himself that he's not very comfortable with, uh, the fact that he's so drawn to Billy and resolves to destroy him. Um, and he plots various things uh, against him and in the end accuses him of mutiny and takes this to the captain, who doesn't really believe a word of it, but has to bring Billy in. Billy, in attempting to defend himself, um, has this stammer, uh, and he's, he's unable to get the words out, and in his frustration, he lashes out and kills Claggett. Mm. Um, and then Captain Veer has no choice but to uh, have a, a court-martial, even though he fundamentally believes him to be innocent. Naval law insists that he has this, and they find him guilty, and he is condemned to death. And then Billy is hanged, um, and then the crew actually who begin to mutiny themselves as a result of this but then that's quelled and then the opera ends with Captain Veer again reflecting on this and his part in it um, but in the end feeling that he is in some way absolved or blessed by, by Billy um, over, the, over the intervening years. Quite an extraordinary piece and Benjamin Britten wrote operas as well as lots of other Indeed. music. Can you tell us a little bit about Benjamin Britten and how he came to be writing such extraordinary stuff? He, he was a phenomenon really, I mean it's kind of my job to say that about him but I genuinely believe it. I mean he was only um, 38 when this opera was, was first performed and he'd already written five stage works, would write another four before the decade was out, you know yeah. he was an absolute... Um, just he was a phenomenon and had this tremendous work ethic and really did revive uh, British opera um, from Peter Grimes which had been in 1945 just six years earlier it was a huge success and re-energized uh, British opera and he was right in the in the mix of all that um, and Billy Budd as I say was his was a, a big a big deal a big opera for him in, in Covent Garden mm -hmm. a few years later and Billy Budd came, the story came from the book, Herman Melville's book. Yeah. How did that come to be then a Benjamin Britten opera? Um, sadly, we don't quite have the letter where he writes to E.M. Forster, who wrote the libretto for it, I've got a great idea, we should do Billy Budd. But we have Forster's response saying, oh yes, I've read Billy Budd, I'd be interested in that. Um, it seems E.M. Forster, yes, was a, was a novelist. Um, some decades older than Britain, but they'd known each other for a few years. Um, and Britain had wanted to work with him. And 
he had, they had corresponded over, over various ideas, including a country house drama or something, mm -hmm. which they didn't, it didn't quite grab them. Um, but they had both been aware of Billy Budd, um, partly through... It was a, it was a popular um, novella. It was, quite, it was published after Melville's death in the, in the 20s, and it had quite a sort of cult following. Um, and so they both knew it and wanted to, could see the dramatic potential in it. Um, and then they also collaborated with Eric Crozier, who was much more experienced in opera production. Ian Forster had never written an opera libretto before and was very unsure of what he was doing. So the, this team formed, this, this uh, three-part team, yeah. to create the opera. And Benjamin was writing this, I think, looking out to sea as well. Literally so, yes. He had a, a fantastic house on the seafront in Aldborough um, with views of the North Sea, um, which isn't the most um, peaceful view. Um, mm. It's not the most peaceful sea in the world. So, yeah, that kind of turbulence is, is absolutely written into the opera, I think. So they'd had this idea, there were the three of them really excited by it. Mm. How then did that come? It was commissioned specially. Mm -hmm. It were the Billy Budd, the story wasn't commissioned. An opera by Britain was yes. commissioned, um, that's right, by the Festival of Britain, as in Britain, the country, the, which was in 1951 mm -hmm. uh, and 5051. And he, again, partly as a result of the newly formed Arts Council pushing money behind opera in the country, homegrown opera, which really has, was, as I was saying, the, was very new. Um, and so they, uh, Covent Garden, bagged the Britain one. Yeah. Um, and, and as it turned out, the commissioning process was, was long and complicated and, and not too um, well handled by Britain, to be honest. Um, but in the end, it was a commission from the Festival of Britain and premiered in um, December 1951. Um, this on the wall here is part of the process. This is Britain's sketch of the boat. Oh, right. <laughs> so, That's a boat. Um, it's definitely yeah, a boat. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a boat um, with a little stick figure on it. Uh, so this was very early on in the drafting process um, when they were just literally three men who knew nothing about naval history trying to work out what all the te technical terms were and where yeah. you were physically on a boat, a ship at any given time. So that, this is part of their creative process, this is, this is, <laughs> yes, sketches this, and... This sketch here. And then we also have some letters, I think they're called the Shant... Um, the, there's some letter to um, Eric Crozier and with a piece of music on the back of it. So they we'll were corresponding, that. that's the there letter, yeah, so only a scribble. And then on the back of that, the, the next letter... Um, oh, only a, a scribble being that it. first line there. Yeah, ah. this was a sea shanty that... That, that ended up more or less like this in the opera, that Britain would just say, what do you think of this, and sent it off. And, and so there was a lot of three-way collaboration going on. Amazing. Well, we'll talk later as well a little bit more about the kind of context of the opera, but I'll say goodbye for now and see you in a little while. Thank you. So we're delighted to have a special audience here tonight in the Claw Studio in London, all of whom are members of the Young ROH scheme. Anyone aged 16 to 25 can sign up and it's free. Uh, you'll get access to special performances with tickets priced between £1 and £25, exclusive offers and discounted tickets as well to our cinema relays. Check out roh.org.uk forward slash young ROH. Now, as we've heard, it's the intertwined lives of three men which form the story of Billy Budd. We're delighted this evening to welcome Captain Veer from this triangle of complex characters. So please welcome to talk to me, Toby Spence. Hello, welcome, Toby. Thank you very much, first, for coming along and singing for us. Amazing what a start to our evening. This house is a very familiar one to you. You made your debut here in 1996. Welcome home. You've been back here many times. <laughs> but how does it feel to be bringing this piece here? Uh, it's the, OK, it's the, the absolute pinnacle of my career. Um, so quite a way to start. Does that That's amazing, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And tell me about Captain Veer, then, if he's, he's the pinnacle of your career. Tell me about the man. Well, the great gift that I'm afforded through my job is the ability to research the text, the original text, is to go into the words. I always say that as a singer, our instrument is not so much this part of the physiognomy as uh, words. That's what we have to learn to use in order to communicate what we do. And also, I'd, I always say that every language is a different instrument. Mm -hmm. And so to have your mother tongue to sing in is perhaps what I'm most 
uh, able to do because I know the, the text so well, I know the meaning of it, and I can find different things within it if I think about it. And the way to do that is to go back to the source text, which is the Melville. So I had great fun researching into who Captain Veer was and also into naval history mm. um, and the background of the story itself. So Melville is the most adept describer of people. Um, he throws out that rule of uh, show, don't tell. He tells you about these people. He tells you about their private lives. He tells you about their secrets. Mm -hmm. He tells you about their, their parents, wow. everything about them. And it's a gift to us because it gives us a, a huge well of inspiration to take information from. But then there's the naval history aspect, which is also a revelation to me. Underpinning the whole drama is this uh, 1797 mutiny at the Nore which happened in May. And it was at the mouth of the Thames, and the uh, part of the fleet that was stationed there mutinied, put the officers to shore, um, and then uh, sort of embargoed the port of London and prevented anybody entering or leaving the port. Um, and it went on for a long time, and it, as Melville says in the book, you know, it shook Great Britain to its core, more so than the French Revolution. Mm. But the mutiny had come about as a result of wages had not been raised in the Navy since 1650. That's nearly 150 years. Wow. So they were all on a very basic income. And added to that, ships, the technology of building ships, had just shifted a quantum percentage. And the, the latest technology was to copper bottom. That's where we get the phrase from, the, sheet, the ships and the fleet. That meant that the ships didn't have to put into port so often, which meant that the men had to go on rations that were much smaller than the previous rations. And the way they got over that so that they didn't that become because malnourished, because they couldn't carry, they couldn't so carry the fresh produce to wow. keep them fed. So the way they got over that was to feed them with sauerkraut so they didn't get, develop vitamin C problems. So all of this peaked into a very angry group of able seamen, which is how it all came about. Right. And so the mutiny of the Nore was put down, but it was still within the fleet. They hadn't resolved the issues, and they hadn't convinced the sailors what was going to be, what was going to be the, the Navy's solution for this malaise. So... With all of that, the officers were terribly nervous all the time because it could, especially on a boat like the Indomitable, which sailed to the side of the fleet, it was a, a sort of a lone scout that went around the fleet, um, that if they maltreated the sailors too much to keep them in line, then it might turn into another mutiny. So we have this Claggett figure who's keeping a very stiff eye over the whole of the, 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 the boat and making sure that everyone is you know, yeah. in their bunks on time. So huge amounts of history and in the characters for you to bring into the rehearsal room. Tell me a little bit about where you are in rehearsal now and, and maybe the vocal challenges. We've talked about those challenges of playing the characters, but how does this sit in your voice? Britain is a gift for me um, because being an English singer, I have that language thing which I spoke about before. Um, but also I have the right voice type um, to be able to get the compass. And that means the high and the low of, of, of the range that he wrote for. And he wrote for his life partner, Peter Pears. Um, and I sort of am lucky enough to follow in his wake. Um, because he was a very literary man himself, Peter Pears. Mm -hmm. And he would show to Ben Britton um, uh, a lot of the texts that he ended up setting. Right. Um, and they would share... So Peter this was a huge influence on this piece. Huge influence, yeah, yeah. And Britain absolutely adored his voice. You know, beautiful letters uh, between them when they're apart about, you know, sort of remembering his voice and how much he adored the way he sang his songs and it wasn't, it wasn't the same to have his songs sung by other people. Um, and so for me, it's, it's you know, the, the, perhaps 
the most precious part of the repertoire that I sing um, because of that interest, the musical interest, the literary interest, the dramatic interest, because yeah. he was such a great dramatist, um, and chose such fascinating subjects as well. And that's the wonderful thing about Melville. Melville's complex literary style affords complexity within both the story and the characters, mm -hmm. which is, again, that wonderful well for us to sort of draw, draw water out of. Sounds so exciting. Now, this is a piece that you've already performed in Madrid and in Rome, and you're bringing it home, let's say home to Covent yep. Garden. How does it feel to be bringing it home to a British audience? It's, it's um, a total privilege. Uh, I, I've said this before, but the decision to bring it from Madrid to Covent Garden wasn't an easy one for the Royal Opera House to make mm. because of the difficulties technically of bringing that set into this house. And I think it's, it's their, I really think their bravery, their bravery is going to pay off. Um, apparently the set sits beautifully on the stage. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing for me to be able to bring it here. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking to Michael Levine, set designer, a little bit later as long as well with uh, Deborah Warner, the director. Tell me a little bit about working with Deborah in the rehearsal room about this production. Well... Um, <laughs> She is uh, in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learn a lot from Deborah. Um, I, uh, I, gosh, without gushing too much, how can I say it? As a cast, we all feel very embraced by her and very safe. Mm -hmm. To be ourselves, to do our own thinking, to bring what we have as performers and people. Um, and we feel able to be who we are with her, which is, you know, that's, a, that's a, a wonderful thing as a performer, not to think that you have to fill other people's shoes, but you're just yourself. And from that, you know, you can sort of be at the center of your own characterization um, and add things to it and be free to think and never scared to try things. So, more than that, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting process because Deborah works very personally and close up with individuals. And so, she's one of those directors who sort of shapes a, a production without you realising that it's coming into focus. You're aware of your own contribution to it coming into focus, but not so much as a, as a, as a group, mm -hmm. unless it's a big group scene. Um, and so... It's an in interesting process that it sort of morphs slowly through the weeks into something with, with the synchronous, um, but is also, well, at the beginning of the process, the third time we've done it now, the first few rehearsals, you're thinking, why isn't this working? And the reason is because we learn to not so much act as react through the process. And that means that we have a jigsaw puzzle of uh, action and consequence. And if you're playing consequence without the stimulus for that, then it's not going to work. There's nothing to yeah. play off, as they say. Um, so slowly you find it again the third time round. And you go, ah, oh, yes, that's right. I look at him there. And we have that understanding. So by um, London, we're in for a real treat. Yes, you are. For our audience who might not have seen it before and for those who are watching around the world as well, um, what's your favourite moment? What should they look out for? The whole piece is a, a favourite moment, but the second act is when the drama really gets going, where it really ramps up to a, 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 an intense level. Um, there's the cabin scene in the second act, which it comes in the middle of the second act after the battle scene. And uh, it's when Claggett and Billy confront each other. And the uh, Veer has to stand on a knife edge of justice between the two. And then the tragedy happens. Um, and even then, Veer carves this path of judiciousness through the whole process. Because, though not a hero perhaps, he's a good man and he believes in justice, but earthly justice. And it's later on in the piece that we find out that he has to learn heavenly justice as well. We've introduced this into the production. 
Um, there is a Bible in my cabin, which just occasionally, via being a literary man, has taken a lot of books with him on, on his voyage. And one of the books is the Bible. And there's a moment where I see the Bible on my desk and turn to it and try to relate to it as if it's come to me to, for, the, for the first time to read it. So I turn to the New Testament, uh, Matthew, on page 1150 in the Bible we have, um, and starts to read it in the first act. And slowly, from that point forwards, there's a conversion that goes on. I'm not going to say it's a definite conversion, but there is a sympathy, let's say. Um, and I think it's a, a very meaningful journey for the character. Because I was talking to Deborah not so long ago about this. I, I think that the book, the novella by Melville, is very much a sort of, it references the New Testament. It has a a feeling at the end of the book, three chapters of what happens after Billy's death. And there is a sense of Acts of the Apostles about it, that the story has to continue in their hands, in the hands of his crew and, and sailor mates, um, before it can be turned into a story a century later by Herman Melville. Lots to look forward to. Um, we're going to say goodbye for now. We'll see you again perform, but thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. We're going to take a little look at a clip um, from the Madrid run of Billy Budd. This is Billy's aria sung by Jacqueline Brylow.
Often described as his grandest opera, Britain uses the orchestra in Billy Budd to take us out to sea, reflecting the power and vast size of the ocean alongside the intimacy and claustrophobia of life on board the HMS Indomitable. To tell us more, please welcome conductor Ivor Bolton. Good evening, Ivor. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. Come nice on to in. meet you. <laughs> So, welcome back to the Royal Opera House. It's a house very familiar to you, but this is the first time you're with us conducting Billy Budd. Can you tell me a bit about your relationship with the piece? Yeah, I had uh, quite a relationship with this piece. I first did it uh, about maybe, maybe 10 years ago in Amsterdam in a nice production by Richard Jones, which was uh, very different to this one, but also very fine, set in a sort of like a naval college stroke public school. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, very effective, and that was my first... Uh, entry into this piece and then I followed it with our production in Madrid with Deborah which was a fantastic uh, six weeks of intense rehearsals with a wonderful company and, a, and this wonderful cast many of whom are here in this production mm -hmm. now. And what for you stands out about this particular Britain opera? Well it's for me it's the most ambitious opera score it's probably its largest orchestra in opera and maybe one of his largest orchestras ever if you maybe don't count the War Requiem, which has lots of extra instruments off stage, but in fact for core instruments, it's got, you know, four trumpets, uh, three trombones, tubers, and lots of doubled woodwinds, E-flat clarinet, bass clarinet. It's a luxury orchestra, and it's, so it's a grand opera, and maybe this is because, uh, well, it has to be because of the situation with all these sailors on ship. There's an awful lot of people to, you know, uh, <laughs> to, to take part in this, and it, he followed two chamber orchestras of Britain, as you, uh, chamber operas, as you probably know, Rape of Lucretia was written just before, and also I think Albert Herring was just before us, but then he could flex his muscles after the success of Peter Grimes. And I think probably it's its, it's most intense and detailed score, and, and probably is most demanding for the orchestra. We started this evening hearing Toby perform Captain Veer's prologue, very start of the piece. Can you talk us to about where we go from there? How does this piece structure itself? Yeah, I just, well, I think what strikes me in this is more than any of his operas up to this point, um, it's got a very tight use of uh, tonality, motifs, which are very hermetic and 
really seep into the subconscious of the public. You don't have to know all these things, but you feel it. So for the prologue you just heard with Toby and, 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 and beautifully played by Suzanne, uh, it, it, it's, it's starting with B flat major and B minor juxtaposed, just like the rocking of the waves, if you like. But these are, this is a constant juxtaposition throughout the opera. B flat major is, if you like, a home key. Um, B minor is a little bit of a sort of, uh, how you say, uh, a key of, of a little bit of mutiny. And uh, so there's a tension even from bar one. And then we start the first scene, which is the activity on deck mm -hmm. and uh, people furiously being bossed around and having to do you know, their tasks. And that's the same tonality, but with um, flutes and oboes in different octaves. So very different effect, but actually the same harmony. So somehow there's a reinforcement of this world, this rather claustrophobic world of the ship. And as you said, lots of activity on stage. This is quite an unusual work in that it's the only opera, I think, of its scale that's for all men. What does that do musically? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, it, it's inevitably we don't have so many high voices, so that's one thing. But, but it, what, what's amazing is how one doesn't feel the lack of that at all. For example, you know, the, the, the male three big protagonists, Claggart, Veer, and uh, no but yeah. they're so strongly defined in so many different ways. You know, we can talk about the characters of Bud being sort of naive, innocent, fresh, good singer. So it requires a brilliant high baritone. You know, uh, you know that's uh, the, the R you just heard is, of course, uh, uh, you know, shortly before his demise, and so it's much more reflective. But even that is a sign of the, the sheer range of the role. But we first hear him because Billy is a good singer. And he says he can sing, but he has this fatal flaw, the stammer, which will be a contributory factor to his demise and why his frustration. He also has a temper, Billy, but he's much loved by everyone. But his fatal flaw, so he has a temper combined with his stammer, which means he cannot express himself, means he gets into fatal trouble. Uh, Veer, for me, is the role of all roles. I mean, what Veer has to do in the second act and the very end of the second act is, is, is totally incredible. And uh, when he reaches a sort of redemption from the music of, uh, uh, of Billy in his final aria, where Billy comes to peace with himself and accepts his fate, and Veer takes that on and takes the redemptive aspect of uh, Billy's music at that point. And there's a whole heap of stuff, the Scylla and Charybdis, incredibly vibrant, difficult texture, turbulent and very hard to play. It's almost like string quartet writing, but written for a full-size symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I would say the, uh, before the final scene, or the, before the third scene, is this wonderful sequence of 34 chords, which has been much discussed. 34 triads, each one of which contains one of the notes, F, A, or C. And, and, it's, and uh, this is the, the moment where Captain Veer tells Billy he will be executed, but we, it's unseen. So the power of suggestion <coughs> of Britain's music is totally enormous at this point and totally overwhelming. And we saw that very intimate Billy's aria there, but on stage we have an extraordinary chorus as well. Tell me a little bit about the role of the chorus in this piece. Well, the chorus, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a, of course, a, a huge contribution to this opera, and it's a real virtuoso tour de force in many moments. So it starts off in the very first scene, rather uh, simple writing. Oh, he, oh, he, do, 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 which is a very pre prevalent motive throughout the opera. Da, da, de, de, which at certain points, it means disaffection, then it's a little bit stronger, rebellion, and finally at the end, mutiny. But these, this pitch is, um, alternated have different meanings. The chorus starts with this, they're scrubbing on their knees and like holy stoning as it were because uh, they're in a supplicatory position to do this laborious and often uh, often drawn out job by the sadistic uh, mm. uh, masters of the crew and that starts off with that, that's very simple. Then the next thing we have is sea shanties which are joyous and naive and touching then we have the wonderful chorus, um, Blow Her Away, which is massive in sound, touching from the heart, 
and something though where we feel a real empathy for the difficult lives of these people, many of whom were press ganged into service against their will. And the biggest thing is the battle scene at the beginning of the second act, which is a tour de force. And it's a tour de force not just because the chorus divides into many, many different parts, midshipmen, you know, quarter deck, main deck. And it's, it's a real virtuoso bit of composition, and it's totally impressive. And the final section has four drummers, in our case off stage, and making a real clatter. And the excitement of going into battle, which for these men with their miserable lives, actually, they wanted to have some action. And then what's the dramatic genius of Forster and Britain and Crozier is to make this then that they, 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 they don't really achieve it because they're too far away and the mist descends. Mm -hmm. So the palpable disappointment of the crew that they don't get into battle. But you've, in the meantime, you've had this most wonderful scene, this anticipation, and the mist descends. And, uh, and the mist descending is also metaphoric for many other uh, aspects of the opera. Lots to look out for. We're going to see another performance now. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about where this sits well, in actually, the opera. Well, actually, that's a very good point, because the, uh, at the end of the battle scene, the mist descends and, and the people are frustrated. And then there's a wonderful um, how, uh, orchestral interlude, very atmospheric, takes a long time, a brilliant feat of orchestration. And it actually shows the mist clearing. And, then comes Captain Claggett, who, uh, no, before Captain Claggett, Toby comes on and it's explains big, his yeah. situation because what has happened before then is that Claggett has um, brought accusations against Bud and he's been interrupted in this by the whole prospect of battle. So then, as uh, Via says, the, the mists are clearing and Claggett, Claggett, beware. And uh, he... He, the, and then it, we have a very strong diatonic D, D major and Veer is seen with total clarity and he's really on Claggett's case. Then he calls Bud into the room and he has a lot of empathy for William Bud at this point and Bud's naivete is such that he, he's accompanied by a horn solo, very diatonic, very D major, E major and he thinks he might be getting promotion. That's, that's mm -hmm. how naive he could be, but that also convinces Veer even more that this man could not be a traitor and not be, cons and not be conspiring Brilliant. and to be a, a, a traitor against the ship. So this is a very uh, interesting first point in this development of the second act. Lovely. Well, Ivor, thank you for your time. We're going to have a look Pleasure. at it now. Thank, thank you very much. So, please welcome back Toby Spence and Susanna Stranders on the piano, joined by Dominic Sedgwick. Captain of the Mizzen, believe 
Yes, oh, to be your concern. I'd like that to be near you. I'd serve you well. Indeed, I would. You'd be safe with me. You could trust your boat to me. Couldn't find a better coxswain. That's to say, I'd look after you, my best. And I'd die for you. So would they all. But I gladly did. Didn't know what life was before. And oh, for a fight. Oh, for a fight. For a fight. Wish we'd got that trenchy. Wish we'd got that trenchy. I do. But we'll catch you and Trust your boat to me, you'd be safe with me, you'd be safe with me, please. You must forget all that for the present. I do not want to see you about promotion. That's all right, sir. I'm content. Very well, but now listen to me, bud. We want to question you. I am the master at arms. Yes, sir. Answer us frankly and show all proper respect. Now stand to attention. I admit Mr. Claggart. <laughs> Huge thanks there to Toby, Dominic and Susanna for that brilliant performance. I'm going to welcome back now Lucy Walker from the Britain Pierce Foundation. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Britain and his opera. <laughs> welcome back. Um, Billy Budd, it's an opera with homosexuality at its heart, is it? <laughs> um, I think it is. I think it, I think it was written in right from the beginning. I don't think it's a, an interpretation that has been laid onto it subsequently. E.M. Mm -hmm. um, e. Forster was gay and as was Britain, uh, obviously as was Piers, um, and it, they didn't choose that subject by accident. Mm -hmm. um, for Forster, it was, it was very important to him that, that I think that element was, was, was more to the fore, particularly in the character of Claggett. Um, Forster had written novels and had, had, had in the earlier years, but had stopped writing because he couldn't put his feelings as he, as he felt them into his novels because it was illegal mm. to be homosexual at the time. And so he stopped writing novels. And so this was a creative outlet for him. And actually he even felt that Britain's treatment of Claggett wasn't quite passionate enough. He wrote him a quite angry letter oh, saying, really? this, this, this isn't ah. quite what I had in mind. I wanted passion, you know, curdled passion sort of flowing through this and felt that Britain hadn't quite, hadn't quite gone there um, sufficiently for him. So I do think it was, it was absolutely written into it. Also, it's an opera that, while is unconventional in having an all-male cast, it's very much based on 19th century operatic traditions in which you would normally have the soprano and the tenor falling in love, the bass usually trying to muck it up for them, and then somebody dies at the end, mm -hmm. usually the soprano. <laughs> so they've mapped onto a romantic structure an all-male opera with all the implications that that has. So Billy is a kind of desired beautiful character. A handsome, kind. Exactly, who's very much discussed and talked about and is the one that dies at the end. So how was this opera first received? An all-male cast with some potentially, at the time, quite yeah. difficult you know, issues to, to yeah. talk about. How was it received? Curiously, you read reviews and that, that doesn't come into it. I'm sure that people um, who perhaps knew what to look for would have, would have known but would have been wary about putting it into print. Mm. Um, 1951, when it came out, was right at the time that the, the government was, through the Home Office, was having a kind of witch hunt of, of homosexual men in high 
high-profile positions. So a number of men were arrested, uh, sent to prison. You know, people like the John Gielgud, um, Lord, Bu uh, Lord Bewley, and Alan Turing was arrested in, in amongst all that mm. as well. Britain and Peers were very lucky living together as they were for a very long time to escape that. So the times were very febrile, and Britain's choices sometimes were surprisingly bold. Not only Billy Budd, but a number of his uh, songs he wrote for Peers to sing with Britain at the piano seem, from our perspective, incredibly explicit. Yeah. Um, Is that with the benefit of hindsight, having seen uh, those very passionate indeed. letters they wrote to one another? I think, I think so. But also the times where um, you could kind of, they, they somehow managed to live in a, a sort of um, hiding in plain sight in a way. Yeah. How did they navigate that, that time in society? Mm. Um, they were protected, I think, by being um, artists, by having friends in high places, mm. by being very discreet, um, they lived together in this uh, sort of tucked away corner of Suffolk as well, so they were quite out of the way in a sense. Um, and I think that they just kept their heads under the radar. Um, but it, it was one of those curious open secrets that is little difficult to understand from this, uh, from this distance. But they would have been living under immense pressure at the same time. Homosexuality was only partially decriminalised in 1967. Yeah. Uh, so for the, only for the last nine years of their life together were... Were they legal? Amazing. Now, this is, as we talked about it already, an opera mm. that you know very well and I think is very close to your heart. Yeah. For our audience, pick me a moment, your favourite moment. What should they look out for? Um, we've actually just, just had it mentioned there, but for, for me, I mean, I love, I love the whole thing and the, the drama of it and the, the interplay of the voices, but the Blow Her Away chorus is just one of the, the best bits. In it, the way it, it appears on the stage, it emerges from the cabin, as it were, and then up onto the deck, um, where they're overhearing it, and then it just bursts out. Mm -hmm. And you really hear Britain kind of letting his hair down, which he didn't always. He was sort of deliberately quite restrained a lot of the time, and instinctively, and he just lets it rip for that chorus. Look out for that pit. Indeed. Thank you so much, Lucy. Okay. Thank you. As a co-production with Teatro Real Madrid and Opera de Roma, this upcoming production of Billy Budd here has already wowed audiences in Spain and Italy. To talk to us about creating the production and bringing it back home to Covent Garden, please welcome director Deborah Warner and set designer Michael Levine. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you're in the midst of rehearsal, so you must be very busy, so we're really um, grateful for your time. Deborah, you've been with the Royal Opera before, but not since 2002, and in fact, it's the first time that this main stage is where you're making your work. How does it feel to come onto that main stage? It is not quite true. Oh. I think I was here with Turn of the Screw, but it is true that the Turn of the Screw began in the Barbican and then, Barbican. And then came okay. here. But uh, it, feels, it feels wonderful to be back. Mm. Um, and wonderful to be bringing this, this piece to this stage. It does indeed feel like coming home. Yeah. When did you begin your journey with the piece? Um, Joanne Matterbosch from um, the Theatre in Madrid uh, invited me to, to, to do this. And um, I had made three Britain operas before, um, starting with The Turn of the Screw, The Rape of Lucretia, Death in Venice. And... Um, I had had such extraordinary experiences and journeys on, on each of those outings that I'd said to myself that I, I would accept whatever Britain I was asked to do next. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I jumped um, and said yes, um, perhaps without, um, without knowing it as well as I might, but uh, feeling absolutely confident that the, the journey would be as rewarding um, as it had been. So how did you start? Did you read the Melville? Did you go straight to the school? Um, how do you start? I started with music, um, obviously the libretto. Um, I did read the Melville. Um, interestingly, my real enjoyment with the Melville has been um, retrospective. It was wonderful to go back to the Melville late in rehearsal in Madrid, wonderful to go to the Melville in Rome, and particularly good now. I've just uh, reread it in, in, the last, uh, in the last few, few days. Um, for me, Toby spoke wonderfully about how it inspired him so directly. 
I think for, for me, I've been particularly fascinated about the retrospective excitement of finding out that by following Britain, Forster, Crozier, and instinct, it takes one to the Melville. So it somehow it becomes a, a, a full circle. And have you decided to reread that because you're back in the rehearsal room? Or? Yes, and it's, they're wonderful, wonderful prompts, of course, to the, to the imagination. I mean, if you, if you do the turn of the screw, the prompts that come from, from the novella there, or if you do this, are, are invaluable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Michael, you and Deborah have worked together often, and obviously you created this piece, which has already been in Rome and in Madrid. Can you talk to me about how you worked together and how you came to, to design the work like this? Well, I think um, one of the things that's really enjoyable about working with Deborah is that you kind of come at the piece from various angles. You sort of circle around the piece. So it's, it's not like you try to find a solution for the piece right away. You don't try to find a design. You try to kind of approach it a bit like looking at a Brock painting. It's you try to approach it from all sides. And, you, and, and the more you circle the piece, the more you begin to understand the piece and the more it begins to give you clues, I think, in, in, in um, how to begin to approach the piece spatially. And so it's a kind of, I think it's a sort of mutual exploration, I think. And through that exploration, I, I think you begin to discover more and more about the piece. So it's a kind of slow, it's a slow approach, which I really enjoy. I like this sort of the idea that you come around it, you look at it, you study it, you, you come at it musically, you come at it uh, 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 from a, a literary point of view, you come at it through through the character, and you're you're always sort of rediscovering it. And and the more clues that it gives you, the more the closer you can get to it. Mm -hmm. So the two of you from the very beginning are, are talking, or is it that you would go away and come back with a design? I think from the very beginning we we we, we begin discussion about the piece, and um, so we explore it. I sketch. Um, I work in a, in, a, in a way where I, I, I work through, through drawing form at the beginning, and then I, I, I make scale models, I make rough scale models, and then we, we work on those, and we, we, we begin to play with those models, and we begin to see what they can give us, and then you know, sometimes we throw them away, and we start again, <laughs> and, um, and then we just keep coming at it, I think, and just keep on trying to find the, the piece itself is complicated because spatially it's complicated because it has so many various um, aspects to it. It mm -hmm. has different, you're on different parts of the ship at different points in the opera. And so you can't really define the space. The, the space is moving a bit like, a bit like the sea and the music mm -hmm. is moving throughout the piece. The, you're up on, on the top deck and then you're under the deck <coughs> and you're, you're at different parts of the boat. So trying to find that um, a space that will give you all of that is complicated. Yeah. We've got some images actually from your, your final designs and these are from um, the production as it's been elsewhere and will be on our stage. Can you talk to us a little bit then about where you landed in this idea of the moving? You've got kind of upstairs, downstairs feel. So this one, is this kind of what we see the whole time? Or uh, no, this, this is on deck um, at the... Uh, this is the beginning of the opera, and we're we're on deck. Say we got lost. I think uh, we could. I think <laughs> we can admit to you that we got lost. I think that's I think that's that's important to say yeah. before we find it there. Yeah. Um, what do you I, mean I think by we that? were both. I think we were both troubled at first by the, the the apparent and obvious demands of the piece. I mean, there is scenically there is no question it's set on a ship, no question at all. But. Um, but I think we both thought that the, the poetic and the psychological aspects of the piece were asking for something much, uh, m m much more than a representational ship. And um, for about two weeks, I think we both were deeply worried that that's where it might stop and that's what we were being asked for, which didn't interest us and didn't feel that it was... It was, it was where we would really find the, the, the doors in. So I, I, you can talk about it in a minute. But I think <laughs> that we, we kind of worked from the inside out. We thought, what, what are ships? And ships are ropes, and ships are sails, and ships are planks, and ships are water. Um, the essentials, actually. We, 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 we knew that's what we wanted. And, from, and ships move. And 
little by little, we began to put those elements to, together and, and freed ourselves in that, got immensely excited by that. And then, and, and then Michael began to, to run with these extraordinary floating platforms. Yeah, the, um, I think the thing that's interesting about what you're, what you're saying when we, got, when, we get, when we sort of got lost. I think you have to get lost. It, <laughs> was that um, it, I think there's a, there, there are th there's like a kind of balance in the production between the ship and what's going on in the production, and and the ship isn't isn't a it's a it's not a it's not a fixed thing it's a it's a moving thing, and also that what's going on in the piece is also very fluid and I think to try to find a space that reflects the the, the sort of poetry of the piece as well as the sort of nature of this kind of this he quite heavy place it's quite big place mm. is really complicated and I think that was our our difficulty trying to break through because it's it's so it's so layered I think which is which is really complicated um, and I think one of the you know the the cues you have as a as a designer and, and I think as, as a director, but also um, just approaching the pieces, the sea, of course, and you have this, this sense of the movement and how do you put that onto the stage? And also the immense nature of this ship. It's not, it's not a small place, it's not a little ship. There are a lot of men on board. It's a big machine. And, and I think what we were trying to do is to find some sort of metaphor for this machine um, that didn't confine it in any way, didn't, didn't um, how to, I don't know how to put this, but so that the, the machine or the, the sort of the notion of the ship somehow remained in the audience's imagination. It's mm -hmm. not something that you would define the borders of the ship so that it's, it's a closed idea, so that it's always a little bit open, I think, in that sense. So not abstract, but it's, uh, there's enough detail to kind of hold on to, but you can, you can, you can um, depart from that space. So that idea of kind of getting lost as you were coming towards the set. Deborah, you're renowned for your very well-defined characters. How quickly did Claggett and Billy and Veer form for you? Well, on the theme of getting lost, before I went to Madrid, I was a little bit lost. I, 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 suddenly, I was suddenly frightened that... Um, that the piece was going to present me with, um, with archetypes and not what we know, you all know. I began to doubt the joke is on me, but not the extremely complex creatures that they are. And, um, of course, the truth about theatre making, opera making, theatre making, is that really everything that counts happens in the rehearsal room. Everything but everything happens there. No amount of preparation will get you to the place that, that really counts. And so there I was going to Madrid a little bit uh, trepidatious that perhaps for the first time I was going to, to meet a, a, a wall with a, a Britain opera. I found everything else to be as rich as, as, as working on a Shakespeare play, that if you dig deep with a Shakespeare play, the better and better the gold nuggets that are thrown back up to you. And I'd found that to be true with Britain, but I was suddenly frightened that perhaps because of the parable nature of the Melville, because of these characters that could be defined incorrectly, I believe, and very limitedly, but evil, good, avenging angel, perhaps because of that I was going to meet something very hard and uh, black and white. And um, I got to Madrid with this absolutely wonderful cast and went into a rehearsal room. And, and I have to say, within two days, I was absolutely excited. We were on course. And it's entirely because once you have the flesh and blood, once you have Toby Spence in the rehearsal room, Renly Sherritt, Jack Imbrello, you are dealing with who they are. That is the nature of theatre making. And so suddenly these characters expanded and became as complex as they are. And the piece, of course, is wonderful because you have these three characters. You have three major roles. I mean, that's, that is rare indeed. And again, to speak of Shakespeare, you have it in Julius Caesar. It's why Julius Caesar is a, is a magnificent play and a very difficult play. And you have it here. You have three men who are, who are competing and, and offering 
offering arias, soliloquies, offering their interior. And I think the genius of the piece, it is this, 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 these three. And it's really how that triangle of character kind of interacts and mashes down on itself that makes it brilliant because they have aspects of each other within each other. Um, and I think once the door to that is open, it's, it's, it's beyond thrilling. They sometimes sing almost each other's music. They often sing each other's words. They, they are not just reflections of each other. They're very complicated compounds together. And um, that, that was thrilling. So, so we began to get going quickly. Mm. <laughs> so Jack and Brylo, who we saw on the clip earlier in Brindley um, as well, yeah. talk to me a little bit about them. What does Jack... It's a very physical performance from Jack. What does he bring particularly? Heart. Um, the deep core of the human heart is what Jack brings. Um, he brings the whole of himself... Um, he brings his belief, he, he, he brings everything about who he is. I mean, it, is, um, it, is it is a hamlet for a baritone, and he fulfills it entirely. Mm -hmm. um, Bryn, too, brings himself, but perhaps to, to a much more challenging um, issue with Claggett. I mean, Claggett is, um, is the Iago of, of opera. And it is perhaps difficult to find the redeeming feature in Iago. And, uh, and so, too, I think with Claggett, that's a challenge. I, I think Claggett is, is often played and, and sung as the, as the archetype villain. And I'm sure you'll find many singers who would say you, you, you can't find a redeeming feature. And um, uh, I would say that um, we've recently begun to find it. And I'd also say that in the last two days, we found something that is fledgling and only just beginning. But I think uh, Brinley's begun to find out that Claggett could even have a sense of humor, which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. But it uh, doesn't mean it's going to be a rip-roaring comedic <laughs> night in the theater. So but, this is um, the, the third country. We obviously Madrid and Rome as well. Mm -hmm. You're bringing it here now, but you're back in the rehearsal room with much of the same cast, but a new chorus. Mm -hmm. What are you looking at now that you weren't looking at the first? couple of times um it's I, because the jump in the middle was rome and uh, in rome wonderfully toby was with us in rome and so too was jacques and thomas ollimans but otherwise it was a new cast and an outing with with a new cast of course refreshes things brings new things so some of those those things that we discovered then uh, are in play now but i mean the joy of um the, the joy of visiting a piece again is is to get in deeper. I mean, you're, mm. you're not doing it again to try and leave it where it was last time you saw it. Yeah. You're, you're, you're trying to find more. You're trying to bring more. Um, it is, of course, incredibly thrilling, although the pleasure of Madrid, the pleasure of Rome, was, was, was two very great choruses. I mean, a, a Spanish-speaking chorus, of course, in, in Madrid, and uh, Italian-speaking in Rome, and both very, very great choruses. But to be speaking now and playing now and with, with an English-speaking chorus, that, it's just so quick. <laughs> 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 it's very simple, is that uh, we do not have to spend time in rehearsal translating what <laughs> the protagonists are saying to the mm -hmm. chorus or the jokes that the chorus may need to understand. Or I mean, so we, you know, we're winning time. We're winning 45 minutes of rehearsal. So... Um, that, 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 that has been a, a great sort of bonus, I have to say. But um, it, it's, it's, it's infinitely nuanced, this piece. There's, there's so much to find. If we were to do it a fourth time, I think we'd still discover mm. new things. And Michael, when you came to design this, you knew that it was going to live in at least three houses. What challenges does that present for you? And what do you do then when you're coming to the Royal Opera House, having been elsewhere? What's your job like to get it on stage here? Well, I mean, in fact, we didn't know it was coming here uh, oh. originally, and, 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 and not, uh, we didn't know it was going to go to Rome either. But so, in fact, it was designed for Madrid. Interesting. Um, so even more challenging. Yeah. Mm. So coming here, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, we've had to adjust the production in order to make it work on, on the stage here, which is, has this complicated repertoire that uh, the piece has to play within. So in fact, just on a very simple level, it was we used a, we had a rake in Madrid and we're using a flat floor here, which meant 
adjustment to the design. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen the set we saw it the other day, um, and it feels really. It actually sits really well on the stage here. So um, it's actually it's very nice to see it here. It's really thrilling. And you're working with costume designer Chloe Oblensky and Jean Kalman as well, Jean Kalman. They're long-term collaborators for you, Deborah. Mm. How did you work with them, Michael, in the first instance? Well, I think, um, you know, it's always a close collaboration with the other people that you're working with on the, pr on the production team and, um, you know, everybody else. And so you're always hopefully overlapping um, with what you do. So, you know, you uh, work... You know, if you're doing your job well, if everybody's doing their job well, you don't feel that the, you know, my, what, where my work leaves off, another person's work begins. So mm -hmm. you feel like the world is cohesive and that everybody's watching everyone else. And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's part of, I think that's part of my job as a designer is to, is to be aware of what the other people in the production are doing and adapt my design to that and to constantly, because during the er early rehearsal process, the production is still growing and, and new and, um, and you need to nurture it in a way and allow it to grow and um, always be responding to the other collaborators. Mm -hmm. So a British piece coming home back uh, to the theatre that opened in 1951 in the first place. What should our audience look out for? What are your highlights? <laughs> Pick one of the many. I, Toby said the whole thing is his highlight. I, I, I have to say that. I, 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 think, I, think, I think it is, it is the totality. Um, it's, it's terribly moving. I mean, one, one, one mustn't forget, forget that. Um, I think my highlight is a difficult one to explain, but I think, I, I, I think from, from the moment of Billy's punch, there is Claggett dead on the floor, I think that the extreme, subtle, and agonized tragedy of the piece is just about humans and the mess we make of things, the terrible, terrible mess mm. with the best intentions in the world. Mm. And um, I think my highlight begins with that very moment when there is Veer trying to do his best. There are his officers coming to summon to the drumhead court, trying to do their best trying, everybody is trying to do their best, and it's a terrible mess. And in the process of this, one man's life is ruined forever, which I believe to be Captain Veers, and one brilliant, bright, true young man loses his life. It's, it's a terrible, escalating chaos of good intention. And I think there's something terribly poignant about that in the affairs of, of humans, and... Um, there is indeed something very poignant about that in the affairs of this particular island at this moment, right. which um, I think is rolling fast into such a chaos because I believe there is good intention possibly everywhere, but nobody can find the root. Um, and and I, I think the thrill of this is that if you, if you get that early, the piece like Traviata is terribly upsetting from terribly early. Mm. So really the last, the last 30 or 40 minutes of this becomes almost unbearable. But uh, that is why. It's, it's not just how sad it is that this beautiful young boy is to be sacrificed. It's just that everyone is, is tripping and, and, and falling into, into, a, into a terrible, terrible place. Michael, you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we can't wait to see it. Um, it looks incredible from what we've seen. We know that the cast is brilliant, and thank you so much for talking to us. Um, that you. is all we've got time for, so that brings us to the end of our evening. Huge thanks to all of our guests. We've been joined by viewers this evening all over the world. We've been joined by viewers in Japan, in Ukraine, uh, Germany, Morocco, France, Canada, and Turkey, to name but a few. So thank you for joining us and thank you as well to our brilliant audience here at the Royal Opera House in London. Remember, if you're aged 16 to 25, do sign up to the Young ROH scheme. Visit roh.org.uk for details and also visit that website for tickets. Billy Bud opens here on Tuesday the 23rd of April and on Thursday the 2nd of May we have an exclusive performance reserved only for those signed up to the Young ROH programme yet more incentive. So thank you very much for joining us and good night.